My name is Shamila Chambliss. Um, I am a thorough military Air Force brat, as they lovingly call it. Um, I, so I grew up from the South and Midwest um, as, by way of Europe, meaning I, uh, my mother is from Chicago, my father is from Georgia, and I spent most of my childhood um, actually over in Germany and Italy. Um, came back to Texas um, for high school and went to Howard, the Howard University in Washington, D.C., also known as the Mecca. Um, so that's just a little bit about me and um, why I wanted to do this. Okay, okay, that's great. So um, you have a very interesting dynamic, um, very broad um, perspective because you've seen a lot and you've been a lot of places. So with that broad perspective, what what is one thing that's universal about discrimination that you've noticed everywhere that you've went? Um, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the um, docu-series Hidden Colors, but they say uh, black people are getting it everywhere. So you, um, me meaning almost universally across the globe, um, you are treated differently based on your skin color. Um, and that's really no matter where you are. And um, the indigenous people, what uh, my history has taught me is that uh, we are everywhere and we are the indigenous, the indigenous people of um, most, if not all lands across the world um, are black like you and I, so. Mm -hmm. So, with that being um, the truth, how do you feel like that truth could help shape and um, bring us together? Oh, um, as far as bringing us together, um, I think across the diaphora, Africans um, or black people um, really have to um, increase our communication because uh, I grew up, my great grandmother used to say, and she's still alive, um, used to say, when you know better, you do better. Um, I am now a licensed master social worker, so I do not think that um, people are just living a certain way because they want to, especially if it's negative. It's most oftentimes because they don't know any better. But when you teach somebody um, or make them aware that there are people who look like them, people who are doing um, great things um, across the globe, then that knowledge, again, is a knowing, um, a knowing how. <laughs> um, and I think that thrusts us to do better. So I, I hope that answered your question. When you know better, you do better. Yeah, for sure. Um, so is there a particular moment that you remember that was like, wow, that was really racist? <laughs> Uh, it's interesting because I think as I've gotten older, um, white people are a little bit more, uh, they're not as outright as they, I think, when I was younger. Now what I'm starting to see is the uh, people who are maybe classified as other who, <laughs> who look dark, who are darker, um, but do not want to uh, be associated with black or blackness. Mm -hmm. So... Um, is it time for the story? Okay, so um, my story actually happens, I came back for my master's um, actually here to San Antonio. So I will not say the name, but I got my master's here from San Antonio and we were in class um, speaking about the abuela in the closet um, or the grandmother in the closet. And what, they, uh, what the documentary was about was the black grandmother in the closet that nobody wants to speak about. Um, and I, I think that's, um, I, I, I just really honestly, without the big words, that's sad. That's sad because grandmothers are the glue. They're usually healing us, feeding us, having everybody in their homes, um, trying to give any sort of wisdom that they have um, to, to know better, to do better. Um, and so, again, this documentary was about um, the black family member in the closet that nobody wants to talk about. So when the documentary was over, we're in class, so there's a, of course, there's a, a round table discussion, if you will, there's a group discussion um, about the documentary. Of course, I'm in, we're in San Antonio, I'm probably, I, pro I think I was the only black person in the room. Um, and this is, again, at a master's level, so you even then see um, maybe that dynamic uh, going on still, you know. Um, and, again, it was a master, so all my cohorts uh, were 
they were adults. They were definitely like middle age adults. I was probably one of the younger, if not, um, it was maybe about five younger ones. And we're in San Antonio, so the majority of my classmates were Hispanic. And a Hispanic woman who also had uh, spent a good portion of her um, adult life, career life in the military, uh, says something, and I guess it, it was a backhanded comment. I, I, I really can't even say it was a compliment because, and what was interesting about this comment was that the other Latina women was like, no. The comment went something to the effect of, um, I'm going to try to sum it up, what they took from it, was basically Hispanic women, I think, like to cater um, to their significant other as well as their children, and, there's, and they're not as abusive um, to their children or scary to their children as black women are. Because, you know, black women, we got attitude. And when, my, when I tell you, you know, I'm giving her the side eye and I just had to comment. First off, not all black women are, have that type of, I guess, sassy attitude that she was uh, referencing. So it was, it was quite interesting. And I remember, and, and she was not even the person who this story is about. So when I um, was addressing her comment and Again, like, <laughs> I was being fed through the other uh, Hispanic women's looks. Like, no, girl, that's not right. Because my mama also used to, you know, whatever, what have you, t in order to discipline. So it was definitely a comment about disciplining, um, children in particular. And I made my comment, and the professor, who, who was white and was from a smaller town in New York, um, you know, when they just raised farming, the farming New York, that, that part of New York. Um, she approached me and told me to stop arguing and that we were going to move on from this discussion. I turned around and I was so offended because I, my voice never uh, went, was raised towards this Hispanic woman. And why I was so offended in that, um, in that exchange was because the Hispanic woman who had made the backhanded comment um, scooted her chair towards me, and I thought that was a little, okay, so we're not having a discussion no more. I, to me, you're coming to me. You're coming at me. So that was one. Two, she, I'm not sure if her voice did the falsetto, but it was a, something like this, and it was a pointing, and it was a lot going on. And I just thought to myself, how then do you approach me as if I am the aggressor to shut down the argument that very well to me was just a discussion as far as where I'm coming from. So I definitely was offended by the um, terms she used to describe that exchange, and that I, to me, um, was was targeted and who she expected to not only finish the argument, but again, as the aggressor. Um, I did later, um, so to close that out, I did ask my neighbor, um, one, who, one whom was um, Hispanic woman, and the other who was actually a Chaldean uh, woman. And they both like nodded me and said, no, thank you, because if you didn't say something, I was gonna have to say something, and I don't know if I could have said it the way you said it. So I was, um, you know, I, I felt good about that, um, but I did later, uh, I think it was like classroom surveys, and I definitely wrote about my exchange, and I definitely told um, how that was very offensive to me, and I think I, I, think I may have even on a one-on-one -on -one said something to the professor, I'm not sure. Um, but <laughs> I know for the rest of that year, that uh, Hispanic woman, though, tried to get my attention. And I had never, that was something odd, too, to see somebody almost make you agree with them or try to be friendly to them when you've not shown me friendliness. Um, you, you didn't respect me, so I don't really feel as though I owe you anything. And in fact, I did not speak to her for the rest of the uh, year. And she sat right next to me on graduation, and she was still trying to say congratulations. I looked at her and politely you know, fixed my dress and kept it moving. I did not speak to her because I just, you, I, no. So I just, that was, that's my little story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I must say, all that to say, I'm, I'm starting to notice uh, people who 
Who, I mean, honestly, people who want to get closer to what they believe white is or whatever privilege is associated with whiteness, they're definitely trying to get closer to that. But in, in, in the process, though, I think it's, um, you're, you're, it's just really disrespectful. And it's um, really, how they say, like, dishonorable to, to you and yours. So that's. Mm -hmm. So. Um and this is happening at the graduate level. This is happening at the graduate level. I was, I was uh, very, I mean, uh, again, I went to Howard University. This was a Hispanic concentrated program, uh, master's program that I was in. So I was, I, I honestly can't say I was surprised, um, but I was surprised at, at the whole interaction because it was, uh, again, it was another culturally concentrated type of program. I was, I was surprised to see that interaction on, on that subject, but now not so much. So after that happened, um, you said that you took steps. You wrote about it in the survey, had a personal talk with the teacher, and then kind of kept your distance from her yes. altogether. Yes. Um, what are some ways that you feel um, this generation can kind of do some things like you did to step up in a moment? Um, where they feel like they're being discriminated against in a healthy way. I think, and I say this with caution, <laughs> when you feel like, when you feel it and you feel like you're right or you feel that feeling like, uh, I don't think that's how that was supposed to go, I think you honestly should say something. And, and not only to like the students, um, because they're not necessarily in a position of changing power, right? You have to go to your counselor, your, um, and I'm not talking about your guidance counselors, I'm talking about the people who, who really put you in those classes, the people who um, set up and say, this is, this is the person who's going to teach this class. So whoever it is, that's who you really need to be talking to. Um, so some sort of administrator, I, I definitely think, because um, I think for that in education, you should not, it is, we're in 2019, um, it's, it's laughable, like it's just genuinely laughable to have that type of dynamic where people can't learn um, and they're getting um, hit with pressures outside, external pressures, regardless of race, um, but the people who are black are hit with these external pressures all the time. So, you know, God forbid you make it to the classroom and then you're hit again. Um, from your classmates or your professor. That's, that's unacceptable. That's, ex that's extremely unacceptable. Um, but definitely when we get to talking about uh, college, uh, the community colleges, the master's level, because why? These, the, as Americans, this is what we're paying for. So, you know, I mean, just really, it's unacceptable. And, but you pay for that. So you need to get your money's worth. So you need to go to your administrators. And I'm so serious about that because they don't care if they don't feel like um, they have your attention. But no, you have my attention loud and clear because you're getting that check loud and clear. So, <laughs> you, you know, you need to make your wants, your desires, uh, your qualms, your concerns heard for real. So I would definitely make a friend in, in your administration building and help me out at Howard. And I protest at Howard. Like, so, you know, if, if somebody in your institution is not doing what they're supposed to do, you have to be the one to hold them accountable. If not, you who? So then it has to be you. Okay. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> no, you're doing awesome. <laughs> um, so, I'm sure that's just one, one event of many. Um, do you have another situation where, um, where it could have caused you any harm or anything of Ooh, that um, Unfortunately, the police are still um, a really sensitive topic. Um, here in Texas, we know about Sandra Bland as, as a woman. Her story still um, sits with me. Um, but the police that I have encountered throughout my life um, have been some some good, but, but overall, largely, not so good. Um, and it is scary. It is scary because you do kind of realize. I, when I So when I graduated high school, and I've always been a little sassy because my mother was lieutenant colonel um, in the Air Force, 
So I used to tell them, oh, you don't know who I am. <laughs> you know, and sometimes you pull out that card like, oh, I'm so-and-so, and my mother is in the United States. Oh, that you would see them um, behave differently. You would see them turn their focus to another brother or sister of mine. Um, and that I just could never handle because, oh, I'm still here. But now you don't want to mess with me because I told you there's somebody who's going to come looking for me and who commands also respect. They're not that smart, you know, and it's unfortunate that the um, police requirements, to, like to be a police officer, are not, like, you just got to graduate from high school. I think that's, um, again, coming from a military background, you can't wield a gun without having some sort of training. So they can't use just, oh, I felt, you know, anxious, so I got PTSD, so I just killed somebody. No, they can't really use that I felt threatened for my life. Why? Because they're trained. Why? Because they signed up for it. So it's same almost with fire, uh, firemen. They can't be, oh, I'm scared of that fire. It, it, it could, I could choke to death. They can't do that. They can't, they can't say that because, again, that's what you're trained for. That's what you get paid for. So my thing with police officers, um, y you just, we just really need, as a country, we really need to set higher standards for them. And then we need to train them better because you shouldn't feel inferior to somebody who, you know, is a college grad because you ain't never going to college. See, that, that there's a power dynamic that happens there. And I don't think people are really talking about that because someone who feels inferior is really going to um, stick their chest out for a better, for lack of a better term. Um, and try to sh assert their authority and power over you. But if you don't, I mean, like, if, you, if you're not really feeding into that, if you know your own worth, you know your own power, you know, they, <laughs> that can be a funny exchange. It can be a real funny exchange. But um, unfortunately for black people, it's a very scary exchange. It's a very, very scary exchange. So um, that would be my hope for, for all instances like that. Um, but, yeah. So some of the first steps are getting out, speaking up, definitely, and holding people in leadership accountable. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and this, because I think sometimes people don't, I was just, uh, saw on Netflix, um, a Chelsea, she, she did a documentary, uh, or like a docu-series too, and she went to Alabama, she was talking about race, and there are people who still hold these um, opinions, because they're, they're not facts, um, these opinions that slavery wasn't uh, that harsh. Or we would never, you know, really harm our slave because, they, you know, it was, they were like tools. So why would you want to damage a tool? That's completely false. That's completely incorrect information. Um, and... But but people really believe this in the South, bl black and white. And so that's just very interesting that we, in, in 2019, as, as America, we're walking around with these opinions as facts. And I think it really distorts the story, it distorts the history, it distorts the framework. So I think people really think that, like, black people are walking around, must be doing something, must be looking suspicious, and then they're dying. Or they didn't follow instructions, and then they're dying. Absolutely not. I watch a live PD, and white women won't follow instructions several times from a cop officer, <laughs> and, they can, and they're still alive. You know what I mean? There's no fear in that they're even going to refuse the order of a police officer. So there's inherent fear when we, you know, oh, I don't want to get out the car, get out the car, you know, when there's just exchange of you're not listening, you're uh, resisting arrest. There's a real fear in that, and it's not, I'm not trying to go with you. I don't know if I go with you if I'm coming back. So, you know, I, I think people really think that's, like, played up, but it's not. It's, it's very not, and it's because, um, again, we don't know um, d the cops. We're not familiar with the cops, the cops policing our um, communities and stuff. So it just it's a really large issue that I think people sometimes downplay um, to our detriment though. Like you do need to tell your story. You do need to go to your, you need to write it. You need to be posting it. Facebook, social media is, is a marvelous instrument um, in 2019. You need to make people know that this is a real phenomenon, not some fairy tale, watered down, police are bad, you know, type situation. This is a real serious civil issue. said social media um, 
can you just give a little bit of background on what social media is? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would say social media is the internet. Um, social media is how we, to me it's like an online diary in a lot of ways, um, an online photo album. It's, it's a phone book <laughs> with pictures. You know, you, get to, you know everybody's stuff. You got the birthdays in there. Um, you get to see what they're doing live. So it's, it's definitely an instrument to uh, expedite communication for sure. Okay. So just wanted to give a little bit just in case someone in the future doesn't Hey, yeah. <laughs> Facebook, Snapchat, all of that. Yeah, Instagram. Yeah. Um, how are you hopeful for the future? What... What future do you see um, if you could create one, a world? If I could create one, um, honestly, for the U.S., um, I see us, like, branching off um, and creating, like, our own sovereign country within the United States, we're sharing land, you know, um, and I can see it too in my head. Like it's a whole nine. Like it's it's a it's the nine is on its back, if you will. There's the tail coming from like L.A. coming down, hitting all the southern states because you know that's us, Atlanta, uh, Missouri. <laughs> like we gonna hit St. Louis, we gonna come back hit hit D.C. and we gonna come back and I don't know where that's around like Tennessee, Indiana, somewhere around there. So it's a nine. I really do have it in my mind, but. Um, Honestly, communication, interaction, um, commercial exchange, um, goods and services with the outside black world. Um, people, the, our Anglo brothers and sisters are not the majority of, of, in the world. You know, it's, it's black people who are the majority. So while we are not in um, majorly, while we are not majorly in positions of power, while we are not majorly, uh, again, exchanging goods and services, um, to me, we can get there. We are, we just have to keep our confidence up. Um, we have to keep, continue to believe in, uh, believe in ourselves, continue to show concern and care for our brothers and sisters, not only in the U.S., but a lot of people, because when you go outside of the U.S., a lot of people look at the African-American like, like all of us are Jay-Z and Beyonce. They're like, oh my God, y'all are doing so much if it wasn't for, you know, and you, you ask any one of us, we like, you know how long it took me to get over here <laughs> to stay, to get this passport? But we, I don't think, as black Americans understand that our American passport is like a Willy Wonka golden ticket all around the world, all around the world. And so if we can really just, again, start connecting with our brothers and sisters across the world called Pan-Africanism, um, then that, that's going to be um, a world-changing phenomenon. I keep telling everybody we're living in like a renaissance period right now. Never, ever, ever has there ever been social media, this, this high tech, tech fast um, communication exchange. We can work with that. There's, um, I, I heard we're, we're starting to have some black banks. Africa, I know, is doing their best to get their bank together, their world bank. And when they do that, that is going to change it. Like that's going to change the game. Cause then we don't have to, um, these other countries, we can kind of scoop them out. And they, they're relying on real um, resources that are in Africa, okay? So once Africa gets their own real bank, we own and popping, okay? And that is going to really, really change the, I think what we know today as, you know, society and the world and stuff. So I'm waiting on it and I hope I see the day. Um, if not, I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely gonna be doing my own little service and work from where I am, but that that's what I see. That's that is what I see. And so that would be cool if we could do that. So I agree. It's all <laughs> it's, it's almost we getting there. Okay, two touch and agree. It's already working. Um how would you attack justice um, 
when it comes to racial discrimination and prejudice? Um, what justice is there? Uh, I don't feel like our current um, government was really made with us in mind or for us. Um, we were definitely included in as an afterthought. Um, so it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work for us. It's, there's, that justice is not necessarily willingly applied to us. Um, there's enough amendments. I don't know if amendments will work to our Constitution. So I think we need to really do something else. Um, we we will see. Personally, again, I'm a um, LMSW. I work in mental health right now, but um, I can foresee. I'm going back to DC um, to get my PhD. I I could see somewhere me trying to go to law school or something because our justice system right now is just crazy. Like I can't even go into detail. It's just crazy. Um, so anywhere I can get in there and just kind of hold people accountable, let people know I'm looking at them, <laughs> I'm watching you, you know, don't do anything or do what you want because I'll get you out. You know, like it, it's what it is, what it is. Um, so I hope I can possibly get in there. I want to start my own nonprofit. I, I want to see what I can do. I'm, I'm optimistic, um, but it's completely trash. I don't think it was for us. So we're kind of working with kind of what we have, um, but I, I think we just need something new. Okay, I'm here for it. Um, so, current state we're in, definitely there's nothing uh, in it for us. Um, Benign neglect, look that up. Benign neglect. Something else our government did. <laughs> and really what benign neglect is, is that they agreed not to talk about black issues. Okay, so after the civil rights uh, movement, they was like um, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, all these black people doing way too much, way too much stuff for us to even handle. They coming for their rights. And so they said, you know what, after that, <laughs> we not gonna talk, we not even gonna get into this. And so then later you saw um, minority uh, and uh, people, uh, Hispanic. So the, during the 1960s, you really start to see where uh, white, and then if you, and then really <laughs> anything that could be mixed with black or have a, a affiliation to blackness, you were then called a minority. And so that's when all the, that stuff happened, benign neglect. We, they don't want you to talk about black stuff and stuff. So we get a little too rowdy for the U.S. So that's what that was about. Yeah. Yeah. Benign neglect. <laughs> Um, I, I have a good story. Mm -hmm. I have a good story. Um, like I said, my mother was Lieutenant Colonel. Um, I had never, my dad came from the South, so I always heard these, like, stories of racism. Um, and I, I must say I had really good parents because they were both critical thinkers. They knew they was going to kind of get out of their town or their city. Um, but the first time I ever saw, when I grew up, there was a lot of hype around my mom. She was an officer, and I didn't really understand. I, I got to see her pin on, and so that was a, just a promotion ceremony. Um, and I think when she was a major, okay, I, for the first time, I kind of got the hype. Or I understood the hype from a different level. And we were walking hastily and I remember her saying something like oh I don't want to be out here cuz it's too many people I didn't understand what she meant at the time by it but she had to continue to stop um, every time a lower ranking individual passed her passed her on her path so by far one of the most queenly moments um, that I remember just growing up was a white man had to stop and he wasn't so low, he was just lower than my mother, had to stop and salute her, had to. And you can't put your salute down until my mother puts her hand down. It was just the, the biggest reverence and, and respect scene I had ever seen. And I was, I was a younger girl, um, and I do believe we were here in the States at that time. So 
I had never seen that. And it was a big culture shock when I moved um, back to the States. It really was. I was like, oh, no. That was the first time I had ever heard nigger again. I was like, oh, they still saying that word? I really was not, I didn't understand. Um, and so, again, as the more I you know, lived here, I, I understood, oh, no. <laughs> they still on some, Europe is not so overtly like that anymore you know they they are like no no we don't do that you know what i mean americans is like it's just all hanging out like it's just cool i'm not sure what that was about but it was a very big culture shock so when i saw um him have to salute to her and again she had to put her hand down before he could put his hand down i knew then that's why she did okay but it was just really cool and that's why she didn't want to stop so many uh she didn't want to be out there like that because she was gonna have to stop every time because the military doesn't play when i see you and i see your ring it's automatic and so it was just it was a very cool very cool experience yeah, that was very it, was, it was very queenly i mean it was and they just i mean it's so it, it was tight it was wow. very tight it was very tight, I must say. It was. I had never, uh, up until that point, I had never seen uh, any really white person kind of have to. I won't say bow down, but you know the reverence of respect. I had never, I had never seen that before up until that, to that point. So. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit more on um, the culture shock part of it. You said when you were in Europe, very different dynamic. When you came back to America, it kind of felt like you went back. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, Back in can, time. For can sure. you tell me a little bit more about um, people's mindsets in Europe versus people's mindsets in America? And it could be black or white. So or white overall, like, again, I'm, I'm a military brat. So on base, they don't play that game. You know, everybody is equal. Everybody. everybody. Um, and the Air Force, I think, is probably one of the better branches for that dynamic because um, we kind of call the Army a little get up. But that's inside. Um, so I, I think the Air Force does a really, really good job of that. When I came to Texas, and again, I don't know if it was Texas because I went, or the area where I was in, I, I was on the Northwest side. Um, and I actually transferred from this high school the first time because, and my mama had to come up there because I wasn't having it. Um, the word nigger was said twice in front of me and both times it was like, what? Like, I just, like, run that back. And again, because we, that was just not something we said. And it, and even, like, for blacks, it was not something that we just said so um, prevalently. Like, it was a bad word, even, like, growing up in my house. They, and my, and I was told, like, black people can say it. But it was like, we, we just don't say it, you know? So coming here and everybody's using it so freely, I really was like, what, what? Like, what is going on? Like, I'm telling, I'm telling on everybody. And so, and again, I've always kind of been like that. And so I remember I, the, one of the boys, I told my little boyfriend I had at the time, and he made him, like, apologize to me. And I think he, like, made him get off the bus. It was, like, something like, yes. He was like, no, you can't even. And so, um, and I, I know the other time was in class. And this was interesting. The teacher at that time was like, oh, and he was white. Oh, they just kind of, we just, they just kind of say it. I'm like, who is we? And who is that? Like, what? No. And so I went to the principal on him. So it, that was interesting. And then it wasn't until like the next day or two couple of days um, during that week later that the boy was pulled out of class. Um, and so it was definitely, like when I say culture shock, I thought Texas was going to be ranch and pigs and uh, Wrangler dreams and stuff like that. And the school I went to actually was pretty much like that. They had the whole like co-op farm on the campus. Um, so that was interesting. I was not ready for that. <laughs> um, again, because we come from, you know, South South Chicago and Georgia. So, um, and I, I was not ready, I think, for the lack of diversity that I saw at that school. Again, I did change um, after my freshman year. So that was, it was interesting. Right. It was interesting. Okay. Um, that is very interesting. <laughs> it is like black and white. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. And you are the gray area. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> You're trying to like figure out, wait a minute. I really oh, have whiplash. Right. I've, yeah. Oh, I'll never forget. <laughs> I, was, I, I that actually, I came home just, I came home every day crying. No lie, cause I hated that high school. Um, O'Connor. Um, but I think they've gotten better. My sister actually did end up graduating from that high school. Um, I graduated from William Howard Taft High School. So 
I'm a Raider for life. Okay, okay. I'm um, a Raider for life. How has all of this had an impact on your life? I became a social worker. Um, and social work was not the plan. Um, I, I will, and uh, the plan was to be a clinical psychologist. Um, I did do my undergraduate in psychology, and so that, that's still the plan. But I absolutely adore the many hats that a social worker can wear. Um, and I couldn't go to law school if I didn't have my master's in social work, if I didn't start social work. So that, that was really cool. That was a, um, a, a very cool piece that I learned. So we're in mental health, we're in hospitals, we're obviously in the community that I'm sure you're all a little bit more familiar with, um, but we, also, we do also go to law school, some of us, so very nice. So it helped you essentially figure out your purpose. Definitely figure out my purpose. I got to going to Howard um, changed my life. Um, Ubiquity Incorporated at Howard's um, campus changed my life. It is a um, it is a African Pan African organization co-ed um, academic service um, academic academic excellence and community service um, are its pillars. So. The, uh, Again, being at Howard University in D.C. changed my life, but definitely getting into that organization changed my life. Um, so, yeah, shout out to them. If, I, if it was not for them, um, yeah, I really just, I don't know what I would do. I'd probably be in the Air Force already by now. <laughs> just living life. Just traveling. Okay. Um, nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> so, is there anything else that you would like to share with us today that we maybe haven't hit on? Just we did. A, we we covered a lot. Um, no, really, I just want to appreciate. Um, actually, I came to this not thinking that this is what this was, um, but was pleasantly surprised. And I and I um, commend you all, and just really just want to encourage you all to keep going. Um, post these stories. Don't have to necessarily be mine, but po <laughs> post them so that people hear. Um, because when you know better, you do better.